thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come to Lorient and to speak in front of such a large audience is a special honor for me, so uh, thank you very much. I will talk about solving vehicle routing problems, especially about solving large and very large uh, vehicle routing problems. As you can see, my name is in bold there because I will be doing the talking, but this is very much joint work with one of my PhD student, students, uh, Florian Arnold. He's uh, German, and uh, he, a lot of the ideas and uh, especially a lot of the hard work, the programming, the experimentation are Florian's work. So uh, he really deserves a lot of the credit for this talk. Um, I think he's a very brilliant guy, so remember his name, Florian Arnold. He will get his PhD probably later in 2018, so if you have an open position, he might be interested. Uh, he asked me to say that. Remember his name, it's easy to remember. He has two first names, so don't call him Arnold. His name is, is Florian. Okay. Voila. Um, a lot of you are working in the field of vehicle routing problems, so I don't have to explain the basic problem to you. To all those that are working in different problems, you will know the vehicle routing problem because it's one of the best known problems in the whole of operations research. Uh, in Google Scholar, you can find 780,000 entries on the vehicle routing problem, 20,000 per year appearing, and 10,000 of those using heuristics. So, there is an enormous amount of research on the vehicle routing problem. Uh, but besides this re uh, research interest, there's also an enormous practical interest in the vehicle routing problem because many real life problems rely on good solutions for the vehicle routing problem. Right? We have applications in uh, deliveries of products to people at home, we have applications in business-to-business -business deliveries, uh, fuel delivery at gas stations, etc. All of those are very relevant um, applications which require software support, and that software support relies on good algorithms for the vehicle routing problem. Now, with the increase of e-commerce, uh, you see people don't go to the shop anymore, they just order something, it's delivered at their homes. Uh, again, we need vehicle routing problems to sort out how those delivery vans should take those deliveries to your house. And we see larger and larger vehicle routing problems appear in practice. So, the vehicle routing problem I'm going to be talking about is the standard vehicle routing problem. Let me get back to this one, in which we have a depot, we have a series of customers, all of those customers have a demand, and the aim of the vehicle routing problem is to develop a set of routes that all start and end at the depot, visit a series of customers in such a way that all customers are visited, and the total demand in each route is less than the capacity of the vehicles. Right? And all vehicles have the same capacity. This is the simplest form of the vehicle routing problem, but it's still very relevant, both in practice and in theory. There's a lot of extensions. I mentioned just a few, but I could, this list could go on for pages and pages and pages. For example, time windows, where you need to visit your customers within a certain limit, from 9 to 10 or in the afternoon, something like that. Very important extension. Many problems involve both pickup and delivery. So if I order a fridge, I can give my old fridge back to the company or in, uh, in courier companies, they need to pick up packages and then deliver other packages. So there's both pickup and delivery. Many uh, problems are arc routing problems, which we don't visit customers on nodes, but on, on the edges of the graph. A lot of relevant problems in this domain like uh, mail delivery, uh, garbage collection in streets, etc. So there are many extensions of this vehicle routing problem, but still the basic problem remains important because it's an extension of this basic problem. And then there are many integrations with other uh, problems, like location and routing, where you 
determine the location of your distribution facilities, your warehouses, etc. in collaboration with the routing of the packages from those uh, warehouses. So, uh, two problems in one. Or inventory and routing, where you determine the routes of your vehicles, but at the same time manage the inventory at the various customers. Or school bus routing, where you determine the routes of the buses, but at the same time assign the students to bus stops. Again, two decisions in one. Even though these are different problems, they still all rely on effective algorithms for the standards, for the canonical vehicle routing problem. So, just to say, the vehicle routing problem, even the canonical standard one, is a very important problem, both in practice and in the academic world in research. Um, What's the state of the art in solving vehicle routing problems? Well, I think it can be summarized like this. Um, first of all, contrary to many fields where we're still somehow looking for the best way to solve uh, the optimization problems that arise, I think in vehicle routing, we have more or less converged upon one way to solve uh, those problems, and that is by using many different local search operators or many different constructive operators. Right? Local search operators modify the solution in small, uh, well, in small operations. Constructive operators build the solution from scratch by adding one element at a time. Right? So you either need a lot of those local search operators or a lot of those constructive operation, operators or a combination of both and then you will have a reasonably working vehicle routing algorithm. So what you end up is something that we, sh what we could call either variable neighborhood search or large neighborhood search, whether you, depending on whether you use local search or constructive operators. Okay? And then you might fit it into a meta-heuristic framework like taboo search or evolutionary algorithms particle swarm optimization, whatever, right? And in many cases, this becomes somehow the unique selling point of the, of the heuristic that's being developed, okay? So you see a heuristic that is as a crossover operator and is somehow a genetic algorithm. In the background, it uses you know, eight or 10 local search operators to improve the solutions, but it still is called a genetic algorithm even though the real engine behind all that optimization in the vehicle routing uh, is the local search operators, right? I think we can say, maybe you'll agree, maybe you'll disagree, but I think we can say that the specific framework that you apply um, to improve your vehicle routing algorithms does not matter all that much. Whether it's taboo search, whether it's genetic algorithms, whether it's something completely different, as long as you use these local search operators, you will end up with something that works reasonably well. Right? Of course, then, we should be aware, should make sure that what you create is not some kind of monster of, uh, of Frankenstein, because you will have added lots of components, and you might not really know what each of these components does, why each of these components works, which part of the solution space it tackles, etc. Um, I should mention one of the differences between Florian and myself is that I like to make nice graphics that integrate well with the slides. Uh, Florian does not have that uh, tendency. So this is a graphic that Florian made. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but some of the algorithms that you see in practice, right? So you have a, a car with a nice engine which is your local search operators. And then people start adding things like uh, good tires, maybe a rocket engine, a screw, and a rotor for a helicopter. And you can put an intelligent animal there somewhere behind the wheel. Then you have, you would call this raccoon-based optimization for the vehicle routing problem. Uh, but what would be doing all the work, it would still be this engine of local search operators that you put that you put in there, right? Okay. So, let's have a look at 
local search for the VRP, because that's what we're going to be talking about in the rest of the talk. There is a lot of operators that operate either on the edges, on the nodes, or on a combination of both. Uh, most famous ones include two opt, we just take two edges and swap them. Three opt, we take three edges and swap them. There's also four opt, but I need, don't need to explain that, uh, I guess. Um, there's insert or relocate. You take a customer from somewhere in your solution, put it somewhere else. Uh, there's swap. You take two customers, you exchange their positions, crossover, one route, and you cross it over with the next. You exchange the ends of the routes. And cross exchange is a bit more complicated. You take two parts of two routes and exchange them. In general, what you can say is that the power of a local search operator is inversely proportional to its speed, right? which is basically shown here by the complexity. The more operations that are considered by the local search operator, the higher the complexity, the, the better the performance will be. Okay? So this is something which you always need to take into account. Fast operators may be very fast, but they're not very powerful. Slower operators are generally very slow, but also very powerful. So this is something that you can, you can work on. Here's a few examples. Uh, this is simply swap. So you see, you look at your solution, or the heuristic looks at the solution and sees something like this. Well, if it changes those two customers here and puts it in different routes, then you get that. But you can have other combinations like this, where uh, you put these two customers in the different route. Or here, this is a two-up move, where you exchange two edges by two other ones. Each of these improves the solution a little bit. And if you do that enough, you will end up with a reasonably good solution. Right? And the more of these operators you put in, the better the solution will become. And you need to put in a lot of them. Why? Because something as simple as this Right? which any 10-year-old child can see that it can be improved, cannot be solved by an operator like this. Right? You cannot just make this solution better by applying only these moves, or vice versa. That doesn't work. So you need them. Right? So either you need a few very complicated operators, or a lot of not-so-complicated operators. The state of the art in vehicle routing is that we have a lot of algorithms, a few dozen of them, that have more or less equivalent performance. And I think this is due to what I just said. As long as you use a lot of local search operators or a lot of constructive operators, you're going to end up with something that works reasonably well. Right. Um, this is a graph which shows different algorithms, both in terms of quality, gap to the best known solution or optimal solution, and here in terms of computation time. And you see they form more or less a Pareto front, where the more powerful heuristics are here. They're powerful, but they're generally quite slow. And here you see some heuristics that are very fast, but the gap of those heuristics is larger, okay, which is what you expect. The performance of all of these, especially on the Pareto front, is more or less equivalent. So there's not one of them that dominates all of them. There's no idea which is better than all other ideas. Plus, um, we seem to be stuck in the literature at instances of around 1,000 customers. That's where, that's what we call very large scale vehicle routing, and that's where the literature basically stops. Few people, if any, try to go beyond that limit of 1,000 customers. Those problems are relatively large, but if you look at things that courier companies do, for example, there's no exception that a courier company would deliver 10 or 20,000 customers from a single depot. So larger problems exist. Uh, and even if there are no larger problems, it's still it's worth investigating whether we should solve these smaller problems more efficiently. So that's what we tried in this research. We asked ourselves the question, can we go further than the state of the art? Can we do better? Okay. Can we solve 
much larger problems, 10,000, 20,000 customers. Um, that's what we investigated. So that's what this talk is about. So this is what you see. For every heuristic, you will get a performance curve like this. These are two of the best algorithms for the VRP at the moment. And you see their curves. This is the size of the instance. This is the computation time. Um, the, the runtime of the algorithm goes up with computation time. And as soon as you hit the bend of that curve, you're basically doomed because from here on it will go through the roof and you won't be able to solve. I mean, you, you can solve a 1,000 customer instance in 600, 700, 800 minutes, but 2,000 will be, well, might be months or centuries depending on the specific algorithm. So from here on, you're basically stuck. Our question was, can we go further? Can we do something better than this? Okay. So I mentioned this, some companies like courier companies have really, really large vehicle routing problems. So it makes sense to think about how we can solve those problems that are much larger. This is, this is Flanders, by the way, here's Antwerp, Brussels, and this is our nice little coastline. Okay, so we thought to bring some fresh ideas to the literature, um, and our ideas was the following, our ideas were the following. Um, instead of combining all these not so very powerful local search heuristics, we thought we should use a few powerful heuristics. So not a dozen not so powerful, but a few very powerful ones, and then focus on making those more efficient. Okay, so we take one of some of the most powerful heuristics from the literature, from some of the most powerful local search operators, and then we focus heavily on how to make these more heuristics. Um, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we make sure they're complementary. They don't solve each other's problems, as you will see. And then we make them more efficient first by focusing them on those parts of the solution that you don't want. And for that, we need to know what a good solution is. What are the properties of a good solution? I'll talk about that later. And then we go even further and make it even more efficient by using heavy heuristic pruning. Okay. So, start with idea number one, which is a simple yet very efficient heuristic that based on a set of powerful yet complementary local search operators. So, I've already mentioned this. I think there's basically two ways you go about solving VRPs. If somebody comes to you and says, how should I solve my VRP? You would say, okay, you develop a set of local search operators for it, or a set of constructive operators, and then you implement something which you call multiple neighborhood search, variable neighborhood search, or large neighborhood search. Right? And the general sentiment in the literature is something like, it does not hurt to try. So if you can do, think of one more operator, throw it in. If it doesn't work, then it doesn't harm either. Right? But there is an overhead, of course, for every operator that you use. You still need to check whether that operator can do something. And many of those operators somehow interfere with each other. They, their domains overlap. A move which can be made by one operator can also be made by another operator. And of course, they tend to be slow. But that complexity, the slowness of that operator, is based on searching the entire operator space. Right? So a move like cross-exchange has a complexity of n to the power 4. But only if you consider every possible move that you can make using this cross-exchange move. So we look for ways to make that much more efficient and much more focused. So this is basically the layout of our heuristic. For one route, to optimize a single route, we solve a TSP, and we took one of the best heuristics to solve the traveling salesman problem, the Lynn Kernigan heuristic. To optimize two routes at the same time, and sometimes you need to make changes to two routes simultaneously, we use the cross-exchange operator. And for more than two routes, we use what we call a relocation chain, which is basically an ejection chain type of operator, but I'll go into detail. So each of these operators are powerful, very, they can do a lot of moves, 
but they're also quite complex, so we really need to limit their, uh, their operation. Okay, so the Lynn Kernigan heuristic, some of you might be very familiar with that, solves a TSP by basically breaking edges and reconnecting them, but in a very intelligent way. Right? And we see that the breaking and exchanging of edges is best restricted to nearest neighbors in the, in the graph. And you shouldn't just try to insert every possible edge, you should restrict the edges that you try to those that are close to each other. Because in a really good solution, you will never connect to customers that are far away from each other. That doesn't make sense. Right? So in those moves, you can restrict yourself to trying connections that are close. Um, since roots in VRPs, in vehicle routing problems, are generally smaller than the ones we typically see in, in uh, traveling salesman problems, we don't have roots with a million customers, for example, uh, we can try more neighbors than a typical, and uh, we, the Lynn Kernigan heuristic applied to the VRP, can try out more neighbors and still be efficient. And instead of doing a first improving strategy, we can do steepest descent. Not that that makes such a difference, but okay. It's a small difference. This is cross-exchange, though. Cross-exchange basically exchanges any part of route one with any part of route two. So you need to decide on the edge to break in route one, the first edge, the second edge, and the same for the route two. The, you need to decide the first edge to break and the second edge to break. That's a complexity that is um, n to the power four. So it, not very efficient, you will say. Um, so here too, you best restrict the length of the substring that you try to change, especially if you have very long roots. It can be very inefficient, so it's best restricted. But I will show you later how, how we do that. And then a relocation chain is what we use to optimize more than two routes simultaneously. Basically, you eject one customer from the first route, you put it in the second route, so the first route becomes this, the second route becomes that, and then maybe um, there is too much, uh, there's not enough room anymore in this route, so you eject another customer from this route and put it in another route, and basically this can go on for many, many, many routes. But again, you best restrict the number of routes that you try, otherwise the complexity goes uh, through the roof. So you best restrict the depth of the ch chain of relocations here. Okay. And here you see the performance of that heuristic uh, using, I must admit, some simple pruning already, but uh, anyway, if we compare this to a more typical approach, where uh, this one, LS1, um, where we optimize the routes themselves only by two opt, and several rules, several routes at the same time by relocate, swap, and or exchange. We have one heuristic and with those four um, with those four operators. We see we get this type of performance. But our other our idea of using these more complicated uh, operators actually works better. As you see in graph two and graph three, here we use uh, Link Kernigan and cross exchange in LS2. You see, we, that was already better than doing the more traditional way. And here in LS3, uh, local search 3, we use Link Kernigan and cross exchange and relocation chain as uh, intra, -route opera intra route operators, and that works even better. So we're confident we're on the right track here. In the same amount of time, we can get better solutions if we use these more complicated neighbors, uh, neighborhoods. But we need to focus them, right? So how are we going to focus them? Well, we're going to introduce something called guided local search, more or less, a variant of that, in which we try to focus our search on specific edges that we don't want, right? Those bad edges bad edges, we're going to penalize them, so we're going to increase their costs with a certain penalty factor, 
doesn't really matter what this is exactly, but we increase the cost of those bad edges, and we're going to start the local search from one of those edges. So if we can find an edge that we don't want, we're going to remove it, and then try to reconnect the solution with that edge removed. Right? So we find a bad edge, and then do local search around that edge. Try another edge, penalize it, remove it, and then do local search around that edge. Now this begs the question, what is a bad edge? What are the edges that you would like to remove? Okay, and that brings us to idea number two, in which we try to learn the properties of good solutions. So we're going to try to learn about the edges that you don't want to have in a solution. Okay, here you see two solutions of the same vehicle routing problem. This one is 0.14% over the optimal solution. So it's very close to optimal, near optimal. This one is 2.03% over the optimal solution. So it's quite far away from optimal. We call it non-optimal. What's the difference between these two solutions? Right? What's the difference? Other than that, this one has a better objective function value than the other one. Is there something that we can learn about the properties of those solutions that we can then use in our heuristic? So is there a relationship between the characteristics of the solution and of the instance and the quality of the solution? Is there some way, we, for example, we could say this one has more intersections than this one? Right? If we would know that intersections plays a role in determining the quality of the solution, then we could try to remove intersections. Right? And another way to ask that question is, can we tell whether a solution is good or bad without looking at the objective function, just by looking at the characteristics of the solution, at some values of some metrics that we define? Okay? So what makes a solution good? Which properties does a good solution have? Um, requires, of course, problem-specific information. This is never going to be general across many, many problems. Problem-specific information is actually very rare. If you look at the literature, there's very little insight in the properties of good solutions. Um, and it's not the same as using your intuition. For example, in the traveling salesman problem, we can say that intersections are always bad. Right? If you see an intersection, you must remove it because Right? The optimal solution does not have any intersections, so those need to be removed. But that cannot simply be transferred to the vehicle routing problem, because the optimal solution in the vehicle routing problem might have intersections. Right? So that bit of problem-specific information that we have for the TSP is not valid for the VRP. Okay? Nevertheless, you see lots of quotes in the literature that somehow assume that we have that problem-specific information. Huh? Like uh, the second sentence, this perturbation can incorporate as much problem-specific information as the developer is willing to put into it, right? But that somehow assumes that this developer has problem-specific information, which may not be true. Okay? So, what are we going to do to learn the properties of good solutions? Well, our idea is the following. We generate a random instance, step one, then for that random instance, we calculate an optimal or near-optimal solution, one that is as close as possible as we can to optimal, and one that is some distance away from optimal. For both solutions, we're going to develop a number of metrics. We're going to measure the number of intersections, we're going to measure the average cost of the edge, etc. Right? Those things we're going to put into some kind of learning algorithm, data mining algorithm, and that algorithm is going to tell us whether based on these metrics, these ones, we can distinguish between good solutions, near optimal, and non-optimal solutions, between good solutions and bad solutions. And if we can distinguish, then we know we have learned something. Okay. So if our data mining algorithm can give us something that without calculating the objective function value can tell us this is going to be a good solution or this is going to be a bad solution, then we know something that we can use in our algorithm. So we generated a lot of different instances with different parameters, uh, a few customers, a lot of customers, 
they pull near the edge, they pull near the center, demand uniformly distributed, well, uh, all customers have the same demand or the demand varies, and etc. So a lot of different instances. And um, for each instance, we calculate a solution that is as close as possible to optimal as we can. We use our own heuristic, the one that I just described, which gets an average of 0.2% from the uh, gap on the, the, to the best known solution on the Argerat uh, instances. So this is a very good algorithm um, that will calculate something which we call near optimal. And then we use a, a bad algorithm to calculate solutions that are 2% away from the optimal solution or from the best known solution and 4% away from the best known solution. Right? These numbers, why? Just we took them. And to make sure that the bad solutions do not depend on the heuristic that we use, we use two heuristics. One was a weak version of our own heuristic, in which we just stop if the solution is 4% from optimal or 2% from optimal. Right? That's the first one. And the second one is the modified Clark and Wright heuristic that we had implemented for another paper. Um, just a small intermezzo, we found a paper that implemented a modified version of the Clark and Wright algorithm by these two guys. Um, what is it? Well, basically the Clark and Wright algorithm is one of the best known algorithms for the VRP. And what these guys did was they slightly randomized the list of savings. And those who know the Clark and Wright algorithm will know what I'm talking about. So the list of savings is slightly randomized in a grasp-like algorithm. Um, and this performance, which they call, uh, this algorithm, which they call the improved Clark and Wright, is unbelievably efficient. Like, it's one of the best algorithms for the VRP that exists, just by adding some simple randomization to the Clark and Wright. I, I put the word unbelievably in italics because we didn't believe them. Uh, so we went on to re implement our algorithm, which was actually very simple, um, and found out that the results were completely false, right? Completely, right, percentages away from what they claim to be. And not in one instance could we replicate their results. So, um, okay, I don't know if they were cheating or whether this is an honest mistake, I don't know. I have my theory, but uh, anyway. So we had a bad heuristic, right? namely this improved uh, Clark and Wright algorithm. Okay, so back to the methodology. We generate random instances. We have near optimal and non-optimal solutions. And now we're going to, de for each of those solutions, we're going to um, calculate a number of metrics, right? I'm going to skip these formulas and move to the graphs, which are more, uh, more clear. Um, the number of intersections, one of the metrics that we use. Right? Do non-optimal solutions have more intersections or less intersections than near-optimal solutions? Could be. Uh, the longest edge in each tour, average of the longest edge in each tour. Uh, the length of the edges that connect the depot to the first customer in each route, average of those. The distances between the center of gravity of each route. Maybe that's something that tells us something about the quality. Um, yeah, and the number of customers. So another metrics, um, the depth of a route, right? The, the furthest customer, how far is it from the, from the depot in the route? The width of the route, right? If you measure the distance between the furthest customers measured along the line that connects the route to its center of gravity. Perpendicular to that, you measure the width of the route. Or the width in terms of the angle between the customers in the route. And the compactness of the route, which is something like the average width of the route. Okay? So we look for properties that might influence the solution quality. But of course, you need some creativity for that. There's not a list of possible metrics that you might use. Maybe we've missed some very important ones here. Who knows? Right? So if you have ideas, maybe 
could do this uh, analysis again. Okay? And we need to normalize them. This is a technical thing. We need to normalize, but because even for instances that are very similar, those metrics can have very different values. Like here, these are very uh, instance one, instance two. You see the the, inst the metric values are very different, even for instances that are very similar. So we need to normalize. And then we throw in a number of instance characteristics too. Number of customers, uh, num number of routes that you need to have, etc. Okay. And all of that, all of those metrics, both for instances and solutions, we give to a data mining algorithm. I'm not a specialist in data mining, but uh, there's a lot of algorithms that somehow try to classify instances in some very intelligent way. What we used was support vector machines. I'm sorry for the ugly graph. Um, basically, what this tries to do is it tries to draw a line or a hyperplane between those metric spaces so that all of the near-optimal solutions are on one side, all of the non-optimal solutions are on the other side, and that line tells you, gives you a classifier. If you have a new data point, then it can tell you, well, it's on this side of the line or it's on that side of, I'm, I'm saying line, it's a hyperplane, of course, this side of the hyperplane or that side of the hyperplane. And therefore, I, t I predict that it's, this is going to be a non-optimal or a near-optimal solution. Okay. <clears throat> and did that work well? We think it worked actually very well, surprisingly well, perhaps. Um, I'm going to skip, perhaps, immediately to the best results here. These are for the 4% gap, so we have solutions which are 4% away from optimal. Uh, and these instances are relatively large. So for relatively large instances that are far away from optimal, the algorithm, based on those metrics, only based on those metrics, can tell you with up to 90% certainty whether that solution is going to be optimal or near optimal. That's, I found that quite surprising. I tell you, I have an instance, here it is, and this is the width, this is the number of intersections, blah, 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 blah. This is the average cost, etc. Based only on that information, the algorithm, the algorithm has learned to classify it as optimal or near optimal, and can do that with almost 90% uh, accuracy. Right? So, so I think we learned something. And what did we learn? Well, what are the metrics that cause this prediction accuracy? There's tools in data mining to look at that. And what we see is um, that indeed intersections have some effect, uh, length of the edges from the depot, but especially some metrics related to the width of the route. Yeah. Was some music uh, playing? Oh, it's me, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. It's a nice, soothing uh, music from my mobile phone. Thank you. Um, where was I? OK, so it seems that uh, wide routes are unwanted. Routes that, edges that are wide, so that if you look at them from the axis through the middle of the route, edges that long run perpendicular to that axis are unwanted. You want to remove those. That's one of the most important uh, things that we found. Right, so back to our guided local search. Which edges do we want to penalize? Well, the edges that, according to our data mining study, belong to bad routes, uh, right, or to bad solutions. If solutions that have many wide edges are bad, then it makes sense to say that wide edges should preferably be removed from a solution, okay? Also long edges, of course, but that is automatic. Huh? You don't want long edges in your solution, but it's more than that. Wide edges also play a role, okay? And then we move to the third idea, which is now we use that knowledge to make our heuristic more efficient, okay? So, for example, for this edge, this is its width. If that edge is very wide, then we want to remove it. Okay. Does that work? Well, it works. Um, <clears throat> right. This is the heuristic with the guided local search in which we penalize uh, 
the wide edges, the long edges, some combination of wide and long, and then wide and long edges alternatively. So first a wide edge, then a long edge, a wide edge, a long edge. And I think we see that um, wide works better than long. So you preferably remove wide edges from your solution than long edges. And the best, the most efficient, seems to be the combination of both where you alternate between the two. So we did these types of experiments, a lot of them, and found that a combination of, or a rotation of penalizing wide edges, long edges, is the best. Okay. So we don't only penalize them, we also focus on them. So we take the widest edge, or the one that's the high, highest penalty, and we remove that first, and then focus on it. And then we still have these very powerful but very complex local search operators. Now can we focus their performance? There's a simple observation that, of course, if you have a, something like a relocate move, yeah, you need to first select the customer to relocate, and then you need to select where to relocate it to. If you try every possible position, that is an O n square operation. Yeah. If you only try to relocate it, next to its closest, let's say, A neighbors, then the complexity drops from N squared to A times N, which in many cases is much better, right? especially if you don't take too many, if A is not too large. And then if you already know which customer you're going to be relocating, that, right, if you only take, let's say, the one with the widest edge, uh, or a customer located close to one, the widest edge, then that essentially becomes a linear operation. Right? It's no longer, or even a constant operation. So the question is, can we restrict A, the value of A? Uh, can we prune that, say, that space without hurting performance too much? We tried that for all of our operators. So for Lynn Kernigan, we didn't have to do much. That is already very, very fast, very efficient on the typically small routes in vehicle routing. So if we restrict it to the 10, ten nearest neighbors uh, and restrict it to four opts, the operations in the Lynn Kerning and Heuristic, it works fine. For cross exchange, we start from the most penalized edge, yeah. remove that, we restrict that to the 30 nearest neighbors where we reinsert that edge and then we restrict the size of the subroute to 100 customers. That works fine for us. A relocation chain, what we use for more than two routes. Uh, first, we found that using it for more than three routes doesn't make sense. It's much too slow. So we restrict it to three routes or a chain of two operations. And again, we start from the most penalized edge, remove one of the customers that is adjacent to that edge, insert it in another route that we try, but restrict that insertion to the 30 nearest neighbors of that customers. Yeah. That works well. Okay. Here you see the effect of the tightness of that pruning. So um, this is where we restrict to 30 nearest neighbors, and that's the curve at the bottom. Um, if we say 100 neighbors, it's much less efficient. Right? So if you, uh, if you try to insert it in the nearest 100 customers, even though that is much more powerful, much more things to look at, it's actually much less efficient. Um, and if you make it too small, like 15, then again, you lose some efficiency. But somewhere around 30 seems to be fine for that specific operator. Okay. Another issue, uh, related issue, of course, is that if you have, um, let's say, 10,000, 20,000 customer file, uh, instance, loading the complete distance matrix is going to become difficult. Right? 10,000 squared is 100 million. That's a lot of memory that you allocate, a lot of time to access the memory, etc. So not, e not only do we restrict those relocations to the closest neighbors, we also just don't calculate the distances for uh, 
neighbors that are far away. We leave, we just never calculate them. They're, in, they're infinite as far as we are concerned. We found that, so the black bars here are, uh, if you took at a very good VRP solution, uh, you, what, then you ask yourself, what is the rank of the solutions or the, the customers that are connected to each other in a very good VRP solution? And we found that 95% of all the customers um, of all the customers in uh, a very good solution are connected at most to something like their 50th closest customer. So, right? And this is 90, the, uh, the 90th percentile. Right? So, no, well, uh, the 99th, sorry, 99th. So, 99% of all the customers in a very good solution are connected to a customer that is not much further than 100 in the list of uh, close customers. Right. So the rest of the distances you just don't need to calculate. And that saves a lot of memory and a lot of efficiency, of course. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm almost ready. This is our algorithm. We construct an initial solution using Clark and Wright. And then we do the trick I told you. Um, we penalize the worst edge which has the largest value of badness. Badness is a function of the width of the cost, maybe some other things like depth, etc. but we mainly used width and cost. And we divide by the number of times this has been penalized so the same edge doesn't get chosen again and again and again. Right? So if you penalize an edge, you, you remove it, um, and this will make sure that you may take different edges. You apply local search starting from that edge only and looking in that neighborhood of that edge using the heavily pruned local search operators that I mentioned. And then every now and then we do a global optimization. So we just look at the entire solution and try to optimize that. Okay. An important note is that this is completely deterministic. There's not a single random number being drawn anywhere, which I think has a number of advantages. Okay, so movie time. Uh, Florian made a movie about how this works. I'm not sure it's very informative, but what you will see in red is um, that first we generate an initial solution, and then what you'll see in red, flashing is the edge that we focus on. So this edge is removed, and then in that neighborhood of that edge, we look for better solutions, and here you see how the solution quality goes down. Right. And if you look at this for long enough, you get an out-of-body experience. And, uh, <laughs> you know, which can be pleasant or not. So, and, and if something flashes, like a large red flash, that's the global optimization, where we try to optimize, again, the routes that were changed by the guided local search. Okay, see, and you see it goes down quite fast, even though it's, it's a, a large uh, instance. Okay, I think you get the picture of the movie. Voila, the results. I showed you the performance of those two very good heuristics for the vehicle routing problem, our heuristic runs like this to get approximately the same solution. So we, you see that it matches the computing time in the beginning, but then it stays more or less flat where all the others tend to go up for the same instance size. Okay? If we put ourselves on that graph that I showed you in the beginning, well, I can say that we more or less dominate the the state of the arts in these uh, vehicle routing algorithms, right? This is for different run times, we get different gaps, and so the, this function is us, it stays below the other ones. Right? This is for the normal size instances, so up to 1,000 customers, but for the very large uh, instances, there were some instances available, only one algorithm had been tested on them, but we beat that algorithm on every factor, um, we're either a lot, well, here you see the gap to our best solution of the only other algorithm that can tackle these large instances. Uh, we see that we perform, if we have approximately the same calculation time, uh, we perform 3% better. If um, we make our algorithm a lot, uh, one order of magnitude faster, then we still 
do a lot better than, than they do. So that's good, it works. And here you see some solutions of very large instances. We created some of their own. The largest one was 30,000 customers, and I didn't want to uh, leave that unshown. So here it is. This is a 30,000 customer instance. Of course, difficult to say how good this is, we thought, because this actually happened on Monday. We got an email from Kelt Helsgown, who was um, the author of the Lynn Kernigan Helsgown implementation. Uh, he also has an algorithm based on that implementation for the vehicle routing problem. And he said, what if I leave that to run for a very long time on your instances? Can I reach the same performance? Uh, the answer was yes, he can. So I said, after a month of computation, his heuristic beat ours by uh, around 0.4 to 1.1%. So that's significantly better. But this took him a month of calculation time, whereas our results only take well a, a few minutes, say maximum uh, an hour or two. So, OK, I think this is a benchmark for us. We can still do better, but in terms of solving those incredibly large problems really fast, I think we're doing really well. And here you see some of the results. Um, so if you're interested in solving very large vehicle routing problems, then we have instances on our website, and you can find them there. Voila. So to conclude, I think we've taken a step ahead in solving extra, extra large. You know, we already use the term very large scale vehicle routing problems. So to go beyond, we have to use very, very large scale vehicle routing problems. Um, I think we've taken a step ahead by using powerful heuristics, powerful local search operators that are complementary, and by making them very efficient using knowledge on the properties of good solutions. Right? We learned what a good solution is, and we used that knowledge to make those heuristics more efficient. And then we used heavy heuristic pruning, seeing that it's better to use a powerful heuristic but restricted performance than using a series of not so powerful heuristics that you just let go on the entire solution. And I think that was my conclusion. If you're interested in more information, you can go to our website or send me an email. So uh, with that, and apologizing for having taken a few minutes too long, I, I thank you for your attention.